You're listening to the Huddle Up Podcast with Chad Jensen and Zach Kelberman. Join Broncos Country's deep divers at milehighhuddle.com and sound off. And now it's time to drop some knowledge. Welcome in, everybody, to the Huddle Up Podcast, presented, as always, by Mile High Huddle and powered by Overtime Media. I'm your host, Chad Jensen. With me, as always, is my partner in crime. You know him. You love him. He is Zach Kelberman. Zach, it's Monday. We're recording this. Our listeners obviously checking this out on Tuesday. But on Monday, we learned that the Denver Broncos are looking at possibly growing their running back stable. They brought in the the veteran formerly of the Detroit Lions, Theo Riddick, the pass-catching running back, for a scratch and sniff. He underwent a, a, a physical, and there it sounds like they, they have a vision for him. He left, the, he left the city unsigned, but what were your thoughts on that? And we just talked about that off air, Chad. I, we were both kind of surprised, and I, I just don't understand. You're going to, I guess, potentially cut Devontae Booker to bring in Theo Riddick as your third running back. And like we said, I'd rather give those touches to Freeman, Philip Lindsay, spread them around on the offense. I, I just I know Riddick is a veteran. I know he's a good pass catcher. He's pretty reliable there, but he's still your third running back, and I, I don't see why you would uproot that. Well, you have a solid guy, in Devontae Booker, who does three things well. Maybe we're high on him more than most people are, Chad, including the Broncos. I just don't see to shake up your running back stable at this point. Even Devontae Jackson, if there's one guy already in Dove Valley making an impression, give that spot, maybe those touches to him, the undrafted guy, rather than a veteran like Theo Riddick, who for me doesn't really move the needle. So that's just my opinion. I mean, if you had a real distributor of the ball, like a Peyton Manning, a Drew Brees, a Tom Brady, an Aaron Rodgers in Denver today, I could understand maybe a little bit more bringing in Theo Riddick, but as we've talked about, this is going to be a run-first offense. You know, They're going to batten down the hatches, play it safe with the run game early, and then take their shots strategically throughout the game. If you're going to, in those in that situation, you want Philip Lindsay, you want Royce Freeman, you want the guys who are comfortable between the tackles and outside the tackles. And yeah. as nice as it might be to have like a you know, designated receiving running back who knows the route tree and has great hands and is just a natural in that domain like Theo Riddick is, you could get by more. I mean, you're taking away that opportunity from Philip Lindsay. Now, if Peyton Manning were still, you know, let's say circa 2013, 2014, Peyton Manning were still in Denver – I could understand it a little bit more because you would have more of a canvas with which to kind of brainstorm and weave Riddick into it, knowing that, you know, he's going to get fed somehow. But we're talking about Joe Flacco operating this offense. And, you know, I'm optimistic, more optimistic than probably a lot of analysts that you guys listen to and read. But I just don't see Theo Riddick being able to come in and make a larger impact as a part-time rusher, part-time receiver than a guy like Philip Lindsay could out of the gates. Yeah, I agree. And, and plus, if they want a, a pure pass catching running back, if that's where their interest stems from in Theo Riddick, I mean, Devontae Booker, he's not exactly bad at that role. He had 38 catches last year, 30 in 2017, and 31 in 2016. That's nothing to sneeze at. He's not going to get a lot of touches anyway. So, why get rid of a guy who already knows the offense, knows the playbook, is ready to go, and I think has earned a role on this team? And you're going to carry four. You have your four set. This position, Chad, is one of the few on the Broncos roster that's a, a no-brainer. Right. So to focus your energy and attention on that, it's a it's a, not even a lateral move to me. It'd be a downgrade. I'm not on board with the move. I mean, and that's it. why you know he. Go ahead. No, finish your thought. Go ahead. I was going to say maybe they're just bringing him in to have him on insurance, to have him on payroll in case something happens. But I think it's telling that he left without a deal today. I mean, the only thing I can guess is that they're not liking what they're seeing from. The receiving aspect of Philip Lindsay, the collection of Philip Lindsay, Royce Freeman, and Devontae Booker. However, Must be. however, Booker is a very good, as you touched on, receiver out of the backfield. He's a natural route runner. He's surprisingly polished as a route runner, and he's got phenomenal hands. He does not drop the ball. Notwithstanding, we know he has that fumble, his first carry of his career back in 2016. He did have a fumble, and I know he's fumbled at least once since then off the top of my head. As a receiver, though, his hands are money, and he is your own fourth-round pick. Like, you're going to bring in Theo Riddick and bounce your original fourth-round pick in a contract year because you're not going to carry five running backs or four running backs plus a fullback. That's just not going to happen. No. 
No, and I meant to say keep him on the Rolodex just in case something happens in the preseason. You touched on it, Chad. Maybe the Broncos have concerns still about Philip Lindsay as a pass catcher and his wrists. Maybe they don't want to put too much workload on him. And Freeman's not a pass catcher, and you know they don't like what they saw from Devontae Booker. But something to me, it says if they wanted him, they would have signed him. So you know, I I, I hope they're going into the preseason at least knowing what what they have right now on the roster. I mean, the collection of Royce Freeman, Philip Lindsay, and Devontae Booker, the trio had over 80 receptions last year. I mean, that's nothing to sneeze at. That's nothing it's to sneeze enough. at. It's good enough. You have the receivers, too. I mean, how many re- receptions do you want coming out of your back- backfield? You just spent a first-round pick on a tight end. You have two great up-and-coming receivers and a former pro bowler. How many more receptions do you want to go around in this offense? Right. And and that's why, like, when I heard that he Riddick had visited the Saints, I was like, oh, well, that makes sense. You know, obviously they already have Alvin Kamara and all that, but that's an offense built to put up numbers out of the gates. I could see how you could find a place and a seat at the table for Riddick to eat a little bit out of the gates with Drew Brees and Sean Payton there. But in Denver, it just doesn't make sense to me, and especially when you start considering some of the roster politics and – Here's Devontae Booker, who's a very good receiver in his own right, heading into a contract year. And even if you didn't want to go with Booker, I mean, you bring in Riddick and give him those touches and snaps, you're taking away from your most explosive and best offensive player, which is Philip Lindsay. Right. Yeah, and, and Scangarello himself has has said that Lindsay will get more uh, options as a pass catcher and do more things with him on offense. So, yeah, it, it just it, – I was scratching my head when I saw it this morning, Chad. They're bringing him in. So hopefully uh, nothing comes from that. I just – I don't think it would be an upgrade in the Broncos' backfield at all. And I think you're right. There was a reason he left town without a contract. So – Hopefully, um, you know, well, the Broncos let that sleeping dog lie. I don't know if he maybe failed a physical or if it, he's being choosy. I don't know. But, but yeah, I just don't see that being a great fit. Now, we still have a few things we want to get to, obviously, today. We're just getting started. First, though, if you are new to the show, make sure you're following the Huddle Up Podcast on Twitter, at Huddle Up Pod, because that's how you keep your finger on the pulse of what's happening with the show in real time, whether it's mailbags, announcements. That's how you stay up to date. If you're new listening on iTunes, if you like what you hear, Zach and I would really appreciate it. You leave us a creative review and a five-star rating. And YouTube, you guys are awesome. Keep doing what you're doing, the likes, the engagement. If you're a new uh, listener on YouTube, make sure you're subscribing. That way you get notified every time a new podcast episode uploads. All right, Zach, I want to touch on a couple things from Monday's practice. Now, The Broncos are kind of going into game prep mode because the Hall of Fame game obviously is on on Thursday. They're going to travel and uh, take on the Atlanta Falcons for the Hall of Fame game there in Canton. And so the practices are starting to take on a little bit different complexion. Not not too much, but we're starting to see a little bit more of like preparing for an actual game, not just some distant game in the many months ahead. It's this week. And one of the things that came out, though, is it seems like that intensity, even though we don't expect the starters to see any, well, maybe a few starters will see some snaps, Fangio said, but we don't really expect to, the starters to see any time in this particular game. All of a sudden, Cortland Sutton came out on Monday's practice. After it was delayed because of lightning, Sutton came out and had a, a phenomenal day. Like, everyone there in attendance was saying, look, this is he looks like a star receiver suddenly. And this is going from a guy who's, Kind of struggled with consistency thus far through camp. A lot of drops, way too many drops. Vic Fangio will be the first one to tell you too many drops from Cortland Sutton. But, Zach, how encouraging is it for you or, you know, affirming whatever it might be to see Sutton on Monday like that start showing out? It is affirming. You know, we talked about it a couple pods ago that this is a guy whose who's ceiling this year is just so far-reaching in the sky, uh, and he's – He's going to have these inconsistent moments. He's going to be up and down, but when he's on, he's going to be a number one receiver, and it takes some time. It wasn't going to be a habit that was going to stick with him. He was going to get over it. It just It's a chemistry thing, and so far, one of the big storylines out of training camp with the Broncos is the chemistry is forming now with Joe Flacco and Cortland Sutton. He's really embraced this wide receiver run, one role and benefited by having Emmanuel Sanders coming back from his Achilles injury. But he's dominated practice, and that's what he can do when he's on his game. And this season, more often than not, he will be. That's why I think he's just a prime breakout candidate and, dare I say, even potential pro bowler. Mm. I definitely think he has that in him for potential. It's just a matter for Sutton of being consistent because how many times last year – now, 
let's just say before the Demarius Thomas trade, which came in between week eight and week nine, how many times leading up to that did we just see huge flash plays from Cortland Sutton? And it was enough in, to, to, for the Broncos to go, look, we drafted him in the, in the second round. He's flashing now as the third guy. I think it's, you know, we'd be okay if we dish DT at this point and let him step up and be the number two. However, once the onus fell on him of being a starter, he struggled to maintain those kind of that flashing dominance on a consistent level. And then when Sanders finally went down with that Achilles injury and he had to be the guy for that four weeks, right? It was a full quarter of the season. I mean, he just wilted. He disappeared. He was shut down, whether it was Richard Sherman or any other number one corner he went up against. He just wasn't ready for that type of scrutiny at the that level in the big leagues. So once he gets through that, and he's talked about how much he learned from that experience last year of having to be the guy and struggling. I mean, he failed more than he succeeded in those reps as a, as the number one. I think that's going to really help him because part of learning what how to do something successfully is knowing what not to do and learning the lessons of doing the wrong things so that you can do it the right way. And I think that's going to benefit him this year. Yeah, I mean, people forget that in college, he, he was a safety, you know, coming into college, and he was still learning to play receiver. It's still a very raw guy, but now he's had a full offseason under his belt and conditioning with an NFL team. He's embraced, uh, you know, expanding his route tree, not just a guy who's going to win 50-50 situations. He's becoming an all-around polished receiver. You know, I said potential pro bowler. I know it's kind of surprising for me to say, but it's all going to come down to Joe Flacco. Of course, anything with this Broncos offense will, this passing offense. But if they can be on, if the stars align, Sutton is the beneficiary here. Not Emmanuel Sanders, not Philip Lindsay, not Deshaun Hamilton, Cortland Sutton. Been saying it for weeks. If they can just stay on their game, if this practice, which is still just a practice, is a sign of things to come this season, I see 1,200 yards, 10 touchdowns, easy from Cortland Sutton. Just beasting this year. Yeah, and we've seen Joe Flacco. He likes going vertical. He's not afraid to go vertical. I mean, he might not be the even killed like you know distributor guy that's going to complete thirty five passes a game like we saw Peyton Manning in his prime, well tail end of his prime in Denver, but he is a guy that will take his shots and he also doesn't have any fear of throwing over the middle. I mean, fans who you can go back if you have access to you know uh, Game Pass on NFL dot com, go watch that Week Three game in Baltimore. Joe Flacco has no problem throwing over the middle. He has no problem throwing deep, and he has no problem challenging the seam. And so that all spells good things for Cortland Sutton if he's got his mind right and if he's got his hands right. So it'll be uh, interesting to see if, if this is the first step toward him really starting to trend in that full-blown star trajectory. We'll see. Now, speaking of Emmanuel Sanders, Zach, he was, for the first time, weaved into 11-on-11 drills on during Monday's practice. Now, it was only a few, and Vic Fangio spoke to that after practice, but up to this point, the team drills in which Sanders has been greenlit to participate have been 7-on-7, and the biggest difference there is, obviously, in 11-on-11, that's you're practicing as an offense, both the run game and the pass game. I mean, it's everything. Full-on contact, whereas 7-on-7, it's more about just practicing routes, timing, passing game, and on the defensive side, you know, it's all about coverage and rush. So, in this sense, this is the Denver Broncos saying we think Sanders is ready to take that next step in terms of practice, playing on 11 on 11, where there might be more risk of contact, more bodies flying around, and it's good to see. Yeah, and what this says is that he's officially ahead of schedule, Chad, and it's it's still a remarkable recovery, and I give Sanders all the credit in the world uh, for how he's pushed himself and gotten to this point. I and a lot of other people doubted whether he'd be a, a, a contributor, a factor this year, whether he'd have a roster spot with the Broncos, and he's come back and embraced his rehab, and he, he's still looking to become a Pro Bowl receiver and a top 100 receiver in the NFL, and he still has that potential in his in his legs and in his speed and his game-breaking you know ability. I like also the Broncos are, are treating him with kid gloves and not forcing him in there, not having him run a whole series just to play every now and then. He'll be ready for week one. And if, if he's ahead of schedule now, he should be back to his old self come uh, that Raiders game. It's good for the Broncos offense. Absolutely. We also learned on Monday that uh, just like you originally reported many weeks ago, Zach, that plan is to start Kevin Hogan on Thursday mm-hmm. night at the Hall of Fame game. Let me read this actual quote, though, from Fangio on Monday. He said, quote, We're going to go with Kevin to begin with, then Drew is going to follow him, and then Rip, Brett Rippon, is going to follow him. So, obviously, no Flacco. I think Kevin Hogan, this is my take, I think Kevin Hogan is, obviously, we know he's going to start, but I think he'll get about the first quarter. 
I think quarter two and three is going to be Drew Locke, probably a little bit into quarter four as well with Rip and basically playing cleanup, man. Like, I bet he gets second half of the fourth quarter. Could be wrong, but I think Drew Locke's going to be the guy that gets the most reps on Thursday night. I think you're right, but I think it's going to be knowing Vic Fangio dependent on how well each quarterback plays. So if Kevin Hogan, he'll start the game, he'll get a quarter roughly. If he plays poorly, he'll be yanked right into the second quarter. If he plays well, he might even get the first half. But come the third quarter, for sure, uh, Locke will come and we'll see Drew Locke. And if he plays well, he might get the whole game. And if he doesn't, we'll see Brett Rippon. So this is a better chance for Locke because Kevin Hogan's going to be facing first and second teamers, whereas Drew Locke's going to be facing you know third stringers and former you know, future former NFL players. So it, it's a better situation for him, and he should own this audition. This is where he should level up to the official number two on the depth chart. That's where his development lies right now. That's right. It'll be fun to see. I think everyone's really looking forward to seeing Drew Locke under the lights, and I'm just really interested to see how he responds to the live bullet type of reps going against outside competition in a highly scrutiny. I mean, I know it's preseason, but for everyone in the NFL, this is game one. This is our first taste of football since the Super Bowl. A lot of eyeballs are going to be on that game. And in rolls Drew Locke, the shiny number 42 overall pick in the 2019 draft. It's going to be really interesting to see how he holds up. Now, as fans, probably most of you know, the Broncos released their first depth chart of the season, their initial depth chart on Monday ahead of the uh, Hall of Fame game. We're going to touch on that here shortly. First, we've got to take a quick break, though. We'll be right back. This is the Overtime Podcast Network. All right, Zach. So, you know, it's always exciting and interesting when the first depth chart comes out. But before we dive into this, just some of the observations we might have, let me just read this quote, okay, from Vic Fangio with regard to the initial depth chart. Quote, in terms of how much people should read into the initial depth chart. Here's what he said, quote, I'm going to be honest with you. I wouldn't read it at all. They come in to me and said, and they asked me to put this depth chart together. I gave it to the coaches and said, just put it in there. Anything you guys know who's been working with the ones, anything after that, it's a free-for-all. And if you put any stock into it, you're mistaken, close quote. Now, Zach, I agree with him. Obviously, if you put stock into it, you know, trying to foretell the future, it's not a crystal ball. There's nothing absolute really about this initial depth chart. But as I wrote on Monday, it does kind of tell you, I think, outside of the starters, it, you know, if you see a guy number two, it kind of tells you where he stands a little bit, at least in the eyes today of the coaching staff. Because as Fangio said, the team came to him and said, hey, we got to release a depth chart. we got a game this week. What are you going to do? And Fangio said, all right, he called all his position coaches together and said, each one of you put your depth chart together and submit it to me at the end of the day, whatever, right? So he gets the depth chart. So each one of these depth charts are curated and chosen and picked by the respective position coach. And so I think that does, when you see the list of names, it does at least kind of tell you where it stands with those particular coaches. So let's start with quarterbacks. Obviously, no, we, we already touched on this because Fangio basically elucid, elucidated that in regards to who's going to play and who's going to start on Thursday night. But you got Joe Flacco, one, Kevin Hogan, two, Drew Locke, three, Brett Rippon, four. My question to you, Zach, is how long do you think Kevin Hogan sticks on this roster? This game could be the make or break for him, Chad. I mean, they're going to have to start paring down the roster. And real quick, I agree mostly with Vic Fangio on this. That I also agree with you, Chad. It's exciting that to get the first depth chart of the new season. But this means nothing. This would mean nothing if they had four games, but they have five preseason games this year. They're having a game when most teams are starting practice. So don't read anything into this. It will change. Um it just there's no surprises to me. I mean, I, this is Kevin Hogan's make or break moment. He struggled in practice. He struggled with interceptions. And like I just touched on before, if he gets yanked after the first quarter, if he has multiple bad series in a row, and if, especially if Drew Locke outperforms him, um, I wouldn't be surprised if he's not on the roster next week. All right, let's move on just real quickly to running backs. Obviously, we know who the top three are, Lindsey Freeman Booker, in that order. But then the one thing I just thought it was interesting, and it just might be how the chips fell, don't read too much into this, obviously, as Fangio said, but Kalfani Muhammad is listed at four with Devontae Jackson, five, and David Williams, a former seventh-round pick who's now kind of late back to the party, brings up the rear at six, Zach. Yeah, I don't know what's going on with the running back group right now. I don't know why they brought back David Williams. We don't know why they brought in Theo Riddick. Uh, yeah, it's it's a running back room that's going to be trimmed down, though. It has to be due just to insurance and uh, and keeping depth behind two injured players that came, you know from last year. That's the only thing I can think of. So, 
All right, we know what fullback is. You know, Andy Janovich, number one, still. That's not going to change throughout this summer. Trust me on that. George Aston bringing up the rear at number two. Now let's move to tight end real quick here because this has a couple observations. Let me just read these out for our listeners. Jeff Hireman listed number one, followed by Noah Fant, Troy Fumagalli, Jake Butt. So there's your top four. Fifth, Austin Fort. Sixth, Bug Howard. And seventh, Morale Stevens. Two quick observations. One, Zach, is that Fant is listed as the tight end too. Now we knew that was probably going to happen, but they list him at two despite both Fumagalli and Fort outshining him in camp. So draft pedigree comes into play there in Mm -hmm. my humble opinion. Two, despite having not seen the practice field since the second day of camp, Jake Butt is listed still at tight end four, which I think tells you that the Broncos, I don't think they're as short-term focused on a make-or-break situation with Jake Butt as media are. I think they're a lot more committed to seeing Jake Butt through this process. Until they get him actually out on the field or he just proves straight up that he's not going to recover, I think they're going to bear with him. Yeah, they still are very high in him, and uh, they can always put him on PUP to start the season, Chad, and free up another roster spot. They don't have to release him. I think they think that he will contribute at some point. They just don't know when now after suffering that setback. But him being fourth is no surprise here. Hireman's that veteran guy. He ended the season as a starter. Fan, I agree with you, is because of his draft pedigree and his draft status and his upside. And Fumagalli, who's looked pretty good in practice, and he's been on the field as opposed to Jake Butt. That's the only separating factor there. They're both coming off injuries. So the tight end order uh, has no surprise to me either. It's nice to see Austin Ford on there, you know, uh, not last, kind of starting to pick up some steam. Yeah. By the way, just a quick aside, I talked to a guy today who's been at every, each and every practice, and he told me that the negative perception around Noah Fant in the media has been way overblown, that he has been fine, he's looked good, he catches the ball when it goes to him. You're not seeing his, like, four or five speed like you might expect seeing all this separation in terms of you know him just running away from guys but he's holding his own so don't worry so much about no offense and there's a reason why the broncos feel comfortable with their initial depth chart putting him at number two now let me move on here to wide receivers not a lot to jump out here with regard to this unit however at the x receiver i thought it was interesting that the broncos have fred brown listed third behind Cortland sutton and tim patrick followed by Trinity Benson at fourth and Brendan Langley at fifth, and then a couple guys, you know, sixth and seventh roster, you know, fringe guys bringing up the rear. But I thought it was interesting, Zach, that both Fred Brown and Trinity Brenson, uh, Benson excuse me, are currently listed higher than Brendan Langley. Yeah, it, it jumped out to me, too. That's two. I believe they're uh, rookie undrafted players, right? Brown yes. and Benson both. I'm, yeah, and they're I'm both. not sure on Brown. He might be a first-year guy that's been a couple places, but Benson for sure. Um, and they're both, I mean, I hate to say it, but they're both no-name kind of guys. And they're both, you know, yes. they're, they're not exactly stars. And to be ahead of a former third-round pick who's converting to receiver to save his roster spot, I don't know that it bodes too well for him. So we'll see what happens. All right, let me move on here to the offensive line. Just a couple quick things that jumped out to me. Every guy I had talked to, when it came to the backup center, it sounded like it was Sam Jones. However, he's not even listed on the center depth chart that the Broncos released on Monday. It goes Connor McGovern, Jake Brendel, and Austin Schlotman. Now, I knew Austin Schlotman was bringing up the rear on the third team, but it was news to me, all right, news to yours truly, that Jake Brendel is the number two center on the depth chart. Meanwhile, Zach, at left guard is where they have Sam Jones listed as the backup to Dalton Reisner. Yeah, it's that's a Mike Munchak decision right there. They value his opinion greatly, and he must have evaluated Sam Jones and thought he's better at guard. And they're more comfortable, I guess, with McGovern than, than people let on, the media lets on. Uh, and we have to defer to Munchak right now. But that's his decision. And I, I'm glad, though, that Jones is sticking to one spot and not shuffling back and forth. And he could be a good guard, but at least his, his progression now can start at one position, not two. The only other thing I want to touch on here on the offensive line depth charts is that Chaz Green, who was signed, you know, he's a veteran, he's got some starting experience formerly of the Cowboys and Raiders. I mean, he's buried, man. He's he is the he's listed as the third left tackle. Now obviously that also means as a tackle. And I know this too that he's he's played some guard, but as a tackle, I mean if you're third behind Elijah Wilkinson at left tackle and then at right tackle you're still behind Jake Rogers, who's the, technically the number two right tackle on the depth chart. I don't think that spells necessarily great things. Obviously, there's still all the football in the world left to be played in the preseason, which will decide these depth charts, but I thought that was interesting with regard to Chaz Green. 
And considering he's a veteran who came over from the Cowboys, so he has some recognition there, and he's buried behind two, you know, uh, more no-name guys. But this could speak more, Chad, to Wilkinson's uprising right now and how well he's looked in camp, and also the fact that these depth charts mean nothing. But he's going to have to show well to, you know, pick out a spot in the 53 that I don't think he has in his future right now, Chaz Green. So he'll have to earn it in the preseason. Moving on to the other side of the ball quickly here. One thing that's jumped out to me just going through the defensive line depth chart is it wouldn't surprise me because of their talent and the depth they have here to see them carry go long on D-line and then maybe go short on OLB or ILB because, I mean, they just have so much talent here. At, at right defensive end, you got Adam Gotsis listed one. Ya boy, Demarcus Walker at two, followed by Billy Wynn. And then nose tackle, Shelby Harris, one, Zach Kerr, two, Mike Purcell, three. And then the other defensive end, Derek Wolf, Draymond Jones, two, Deshaun Williams, three. So you got both Walker as one number two defensive end and then Jones as the other. I mean, they can go ahead and cut Billy Wynn now, right? I mean, if they're confident enough in having Walker as a direct backup there, uh, why even have Wynn around and, and, and maybe use that roster spot for somebody else? So I mean, on its face, it's not surprising that any of these starters are listed where they are. Uh, but it's um, I would think they were going to have Draymond Jones at nose tackle, maybe as third, but to have him strictly at defensive end, another guy where I like that they're not moving him around. They're not going to DeMarcus Walker him. They're going to treat him right you know, and develop him correctly. Moving on to the linebackers, the only thing that I really want to touch on here, well, two things. One, Justin Hollins, the rookie fifth rounder who they've been kind of moving around, they only have him listed with the edge players. He's listed as Bradley Chubb's backup on the strong side currently, so in the number two. And then at the off-ball linebacker position, Zach, obviously we know it's Josie Jewell and Todd Davis are the starters. Behind Jewell, the number one backup is Joseph Jones. And behind Davis, they have it as A.J. Alexander Johnson and then Josh Watson. This is the most unpredictable group right now. Uh, And this is going to come down truly to the five preseason games they have. All of these players, Chad, I guess with the exception of the area, have gotten first-team reps in practice, including Josh Watson, who's listed as... I guess, what, the seventh linebacker on the depth chart. So this is, you know, it's totally tentative right now. It's not set in stone by any means, and it's going to change rapidly and multiple times over the course of the next couple of weeks. Last thing I want to touch on on defense is, and then we'll just really quick talk about one thing that jumped out to me on special and we'll get out of here for today, is that Kareem Jackson listed number one strong safety. We knew that was probably going to be the case, but he's not listed at corner at all. He's listed only, obviously, at, at, at strong safety. His backup is Sua Cravens, not Will Parks. Free safety, Justin Simmons, followed by his backup being Will Parks. So I think if the Broncos were whittling the roster down today to 53, those would be your four safeties they keep. Possibly a fifth, and if they did, it would be probably DeMonte Thomas would be my guess at this point. But it's interesting, Trey Marshall's up there higher in the eyes of the current coaching staff than, say, Jamal Carter, who's got a little bit more experience on the active roster. Yeah, coming off that that injury, though, I think it it hurt his chances ultimately. But this, to me, uh, speaks volumes for Sua Cravens, Chad, a guy that was put uh, under the microscope by Vic Fangio multiple times this offseason, and he's the direct backup right now, just in the place that Will Parks was, or is, and we all know Parks is cemented into a roster spot. So perhaps Cravens is, is showing well in practice that if they can get, as we touched on, Chad, anything out of him this year is a bonus. They still have a player who has potential there. So it's good to see he's not a lost cause just yet. All right, last thing I want to get to here on special teams. Obviously, exactly who you expect. There's no further competition at kicker or punter. So it's McManus, Wadman, Casey Kreider, long snapper. But the returner positions... You know, the usual suspects at kick returner, Devontae Booker, River Craycraft, Brendan Langley, Devontae Jackson, punt returner, River Craycraft, Deshaun Hamilton, Brendan Langley, Kelvin McKnight in those orders as listed, missing from either returner, Trinity Benson, which I thought was interesting. Yeah, and Tom McMahon said that he's going to have so many returners in this Hall of Fame game, and that's another spot where it's going to come down to the preseason. But yeah, his omission there is definitely notable. And also the fact that River Craycraft, coming off an injury, an oblique injury chat, he's still listed as either the primary guy or the second guy. They value his hands, and that's what they want more from the returner than anything else. Any sort of speed factor, that's why Langley's at the bottom. They want a guy with sure hands. So Devontae Booker, there's his value right there. Another reason why Theo Riddick is is not really a good option to have on the roster. Well, hey, like I said, just a few interesting insights from looking at the initial depth chart that Vic Fangio basically had his staff just, you know, craft really quickly ahead of this Thursday night game. Don't read too much into it. Everything that was of note to Zach and I anyway we touched on tonight. So 
just uh, we'll look forward to the game on Thursday. But that's going to do it for today's episode of the podcast. Make sure you're following the show on Twitter at Huddle Up Pod. You can find my partner Zach Kelberman on Twitter at Kelberman twenty four seven. It remains. He'll let you know if he changes his handle. Myself, at Chad and Jensen, and stay tuned. Tomorrow will be the Scouts Eye Preview from the Building the Broncos guys going through the matchup and just kind of what to expect and, you know, matchups, et cetera, for Thursday night. And then Zach and I will be back later on in the week. So stay tuned for that. For Zach Kelberman, I'm Chad Jensen. We'll talk to you then. You've been listening to the Huddle Up Podcast. Join Broncos Country's deep divers at milehighhuddle.com to keep the conversation going.